American West. You might call this the cradle of our culture. It was here that our national character was molded, in myth and in reality. The Old West was already steeped in plenty of history when the General Land Office here opened back in 1862. In the years between 1845 and 1848, we'd added more than one million square miles of territory. And the U.S. of A. was about as big as it was going to get. Settlers were pouring in from back east, eager for a piece of those wide open spaces. In fact, there was so much land out there that the government was giving it away to any homesteader who showed up ready and able. The boys in the land office signed over about 290 million acres. Beginning of the boom, you might say. Manifest destiny, they called it those early 19th century Americans who forged their way into the West. From Kentucky and Tennessee, many pressed on to the Midwest. Others kept on going right on down to the Rio Grande, or out to the very edge of civilization, the Pacific. They hewed out forests for homesteads, planted crops for food, hunted and trapped, and grazed their livestock. Back in Washington, the Secretary of the Treasury, who oversaw the collection of revenues from the sale of these homesteads, soon began to realize that the relatively small general land office would soon be overwhelmed by this enormous responsibility. He suggested that a home department be established to handle these duties. Now this wasn't a new idea. As early as 1789, a home department had been called for. But in their wisdom, the first Congress had decided that three departments, state, treasury, and war, were quite enough. Thomas Jefferson, the first Secretary of State, was none too pleased, having to spend most of his time on domestic matters, especially the disposition of patents and operation of the mint. In spite of the support of presidents and members of Congress, discussions of a home department always ended in a plan for further investigation. And so the suggestion for a department that would handle domestic affairs was studied to death for the next 60 years. Finally, on the last day of the 30th Congress, March 3, 1849, Senators Jefferson Davis of Mississippi and Daniel Webster of Massachusetts joined forces to convince their fellow legislators of the need for a department that would handle the growing internal affairs of the nation. In a close vote that night, the Senate decided, 31 to 25, to combine the land office and the patent office from the State Department with the Indian Bureau from the War Department and create the Department of the Interior. Oh, everything upon the face of God's earth will go to the Home Department, John C. Calhoun had lamented. And in the beginning, it did. In fact, the Home Department did seem to lack a unifying purpose, a real boon to satirists of the day. The new department took on virtually every task no other could or would do. Early tasks included conducting the census, granting patents, distributing soldiers' pensions, constructing the water system in the nation's capital, exploring wilderness, managing hospitals and universities, and even colonizing the freed slaves in Haiti. 
But in spite of this early lack of a clearly defined purpose, the Department of the Interior was to play an important role in the internal development of the nation and the welfare of its people. One of its first tasks, however, was to find a new home. No longer a part of the State Department, the fledgling department rented space on the second floor of a brick office building in downtown Washington. Within a few years, it outgrew its rented space, and most of Interior's employees moved to the new patent office building, one of the most impressive government buildings in Washington. It was home to the department for over 60 years. Today, the building houses one of the Smithsonian's exhibits. Because a concern for Western problems had given birth to the department, it was only fitting that the West should be the scene of many of its early activities. The General Land Office, established in 1812, played a major role in parceling out homesteads, many of which went for as little as $1.25 an acre. Led on by promoters to expect land that only had to be tickled with a hole to laugh with a harvest. Settlers soon came to realize that it was more like a bet between the government and the settler over whether the settler could make a living. But most stayed, and the land office, for the most part, made sure that the settlers got their land that the railroads were able to bring in fresh supplies and news from the East, and that agricultural colleges and state universities were established. The new department had other significant roles in the early West. Some ended with the passing of that era. Others grew and remained vital parts of the department. The Mexican Boundary Commission, for instance, ran the new international boundary between the United States and Mexico, and later fixed the boundary between Texas and New Mexico. The Pacific Wagon Road Office improved the cross-country routes taken by those who came out to tame the Wild West. the department made sure that the Pacific Railroads got up and running, bringing supplies and news to settlers and adventurers alike. Beginning in 1873, governors and other high officials in the Western Territories reported to the Secretary of the Interior. And as states emerged from those territories, the department acted as a guardian supervising the statehood process. Shortly after the Civil War, Interior began its own official exploration of the American West, challenging what had once been the domain of the War Department. Major John Powell's exploration of the Rocky Mountain region, funded by Interior, emphasized the need for scientific, rational use of Western lands and resources and helped lay the foundation for the modern conservation movement. Later, Powell would become the director of the Geologic Survey Office within the department. About the same time, Congress established the first national park, Yellowstone, and soon added Sequoia, Yosemite, and Mount Rainier. Eventually, the National Park Service was created to protect and promote their use. But not all the attention was on the West. Many of the early interior programs had national impact. After the Civil War, nearly a million and a half veterans lobbied for increasing pension benefits. By 1890, more than 6,000 agents, medical examiners, and clerks labored methodically and unspectacularly in Interior's Pension Bureau. 
making sure that everyone who deserved to be compensated for their service to Mr. Lincoln's war was. Meanwhile, their counterparts in the patent office felt the pressures of the Industrial Revolution. By 1890, patent officials were receiving more than 41,000 applications a year and issuing 26,000 patents. Over the years, the Department of the Interior guided and nourished activities and programs that eventually went on to become separate agencies and independent departments. Many would come to refer to it as the Mother Department. The Departments of Agriculture, Labor, Commerce, Energy, and Education and the Veterans Administration all had their start as small offices or bureaus within Interior. But its nurturing enthusiasm didn't stop with its own interests. The Department of Interior was one of the earliest contributors to the Smithsonian, transferring its extensive collections of artifacts from government-backed explorations like the Wilkes Expedition to the South Sea and national treasures like the Declaration of Independence to the newly formed museum. Now, most 19th century Americans believed that the country's bountiful resources were inexhaustible. But with the inauguration of Teddy Roosevelt in 1901, Americans entered a new era of awareness. The conservation movement took hold. Contrary to modern thinking, however, the early conservationists did not want to lock up the resources and save them for the future. Instead, their goal was wise development regulated by government. Out of this newfound concern, and backed by Interior, came scientifically guided activities which would harness the nation's resources to benefit society. One such activity, reclamation, gave birth to the reclamation service. By 1902, the reclamation movement had already championed the construction of dams and aqueducts in the arid and semi-arid regions of the West, reclaiming those lands for farming. In 1903, for instance, the Salt River Project with its Roosevelt Dam transformed Phoenix, Arizona from a barren desert into an important agricultural center. Later Bureau of Reclamation projects, such as the Hoover and Grand Coulee dams, the All-American Canal, and the Alva Adams Tunnel would bring water, flood control, electric power, and recreational resources to vast areas of the country that otherwise would have been left uninhabited. Today, the responsibilities of the Bureau of Reclamation encompass a wide range of water resource management efforts, many of which are still in the American West. President Roosevelt and the Secretary of Interior were also committed to resource preservation, setting aside the Grand Canyon as a national treasure and establishing the country's first wildlife sanctuary in Florida. Their efforts were praised by a host of others who cherished the value and appeal of undeveloped places and resources. By the time President Wilson signed legislation creating the National Park Service, there were 14 national parks and 21 national monuments, most of them west of the Mississippi. Today, there are over 350 areas nationwide, totaling nearly 80 million acres. From the giant sequoias to the Statue of Liberty, the National Park Service has built and maintains the largest and most abundant system of national parks in the world. The conservation crusade of the early 20th century had given a sharper focus to the department. 
Interior became less and less a grab bag of miscellaneous tasks that no one else wanted, and more and more a natural resources agency. The Bureau of Indian Affairs, focusing on human needs, was the major exception. At first, the government wanted to contain the Indians, hoping that reservations would keep the Native Americans out of the path of expansion and provide what was then viewed as the ultimate gift, assimilation into the Euro-American mainstream. In the late 1880s, a new so-called progressive policy was initiated. Its primary purpose was to break up the reservation system by providing heads of Native American families with 160-acre allotments. It was thought that once the Indian became a landowner and a farmer, tribal affiliations would wither and the need for reservations would evaporate. Unfortunately, these policies failed to foresee the terrible cost in human suffering. It wasn't until the late 60s that self-determination became the federal policy. Today, the Department of Interior's Bureau of Indian Affairs works diligently to give tribes continually increasing control of their destiny without terminating the government's historic responsibilities to the first Americans. At the outbreak of World War I, the Geological Survey, which had been the pride of the government for its scientific innovation and basic research, was called upon to focus its efforts on matters related to military and industrial preparedness. Its map-making capabilities, renowned worldwide, became an important part of that effort. During World War II, the survey again directed its efforts toward mapping strategic areas and identifying critical minerals. In both wars, the Geological Survey provided information, technologies, and resources that were impressive, to say the least. By the 70s, satellite technology had stretched the survey's capabilities from the depths of the Grand Canyon to the craters on the moon. Today, the Geological Survey is the federal government's largest civilian map maker, the primary source of data on the country's land, water, and minerals, and the employer of the largest number of earth science professionals in the world. But it wasn't just what was on top that concerned the folks at Interior. What lay underneath the surface of the nation was also of vital importance to the country. You won't see those gaping, deserted holes in the ground anymore. Thanks to the folks at the Office of Surface Mining, areas that once suffered from the side effects of mining are now being restored to their original beauty. In a lot of instances, they're even better. And the Minerals Management Service ensures that our offshore resources are protected and that revenues from mineral leases are collected. Now that's important. Those folks have collected more than six and a half billion dollars for new parks and recreation areas from those funds. Right after World War II, the General Land Office, one of the oldest bureaus, and the Grazing Service, one of the newest, were merged to form the Bureau of Land Management, considered the core of the modern department. From timber, oil and gas, to wildlife habitats, and from archaeological digs to conservation projects, BLM conducts a broader range of resource management functions than any other agency within the department. Before Hawaii and Alaska became states in 1959, they were territories of the United States. Hawaii, long a popular stopping point for American ships bound for Asia, and a center of increasing importance for its sugar crop, was our first annexation in the Pacific. 
Alaska was purchased by Secretary of State Seward from the Russians, who found it too remote to govern. The going price was $7 million. And while Americans admitted that the new possession was big, several newspapers of the day doubted the value of the territory and nicknamed it Seward's Folly. U.S.-owned territories still dot the world, mainly in the Pacific, and the Department of the Interior is responsible for their well-being. The Office of Territorial and International Affairs promotes the economic, social, and political development of these areas. With an eye toward greater self-government and active participation by the inhabitants in determining the future course of their homelands. By 1987, the Fish and Wildlife Service was operating 434 national wildlife refuges, 150 waterfowl production areas containing more than 90 million acres, 12 major fish and wildlife labs, 36 cooperative research units in universities, 73 national fish hatcheries, and a nationwide network of wildlife law enforcement agents. Now that's a long way from the single refuge set up by Teddy Roosevelt so long ago. But like their grandparents and great-grandparents, Americans today are anxious to see their country's wildlife and wilderness protected. A large chunk of that protection is paid for by the proceeds from the federal duck stamp. Ding Darling, a prominent political cartoonist with the Des Moines Register, and a hunter and wildlife enthusiast, started it all. His simple idea mushroomed into a popular national competition that has generated over $313 million used to acquire and preserve refuge wetlands. He went on to take a job as the chief of the Bureau of Biological Survey. Oh, some mighty interesting characters have worked at the department. Dean was there about the same time as Rachel Carson. She went on to write Silent Spring, condemning the use of DDT and other pesticides. A short book, but probably one of the most influential books of the 20th century. Walt Whitman, the famous poet, worked here for a while as a clerk in the Indian Bureau. He got laid off in a move to save some money. <laughs> no matter how much things change, they're always the same. Had some real characters as secretary, too. One stayed only 11 days, said the job was too much for his peculiar nervous temperament. Another one stayed for nearly 13 years. We've had secretaries born in Germany, in Canada, and in the District of Columbia. One was a 20-year insider, another a congressman, a governor, and one that went on to be a justice of the Supreme Court. Now, one good old boy got the job just because he was the poker partner of the president. Some have been unobtrusive, others outspoken. But most have been hardworking, honest individuals who kept the welfare of the nation's resources and people as their foremost goal. Under their leadership, the Department of Interior has grown into one of the most respected agencies within the federal system. Whether meeting the internal needs of a new nation or serving the complex needs of a changing world, the men and women of the Department of the Interior have met every challenge. What started out as a concern for the land and folks in the Western Territories has blossomed into a concern for lands and folks all over the world. In the next century, twice as many people will be dependent on dwindling amounts of resources. The Department of Interior has already taken the lead in serving as a global provider of scientific data and hands-on help to miners, 
farmers, developers, and scientists throughout the world. Shaping policies that foster a better life for our nation and the world. A sharing of resources, better management of technology, and living within our planet's ecological means. And providing leadership and dedication that have become the trademark of the folks who work or have worked for the Department of the Interior. But then, would you expect any less from a place they once called home?